Kevin, thank you so much for this opportunity. And uh, I always go by Jerry and people like to use titles. I'm honored, but uh, we are having a conversation among colleagues. And uh, I also want to thank you for those kind comments about the importance of listening, patients, families, and other members of the team. There is no greater tool in promoting safety than a process of recording, listening, responding to the things that uh, patients, families, and staff say. And that really is a key element of addressing professional accountability. And I want to make that case. Now, I also want to remind everybody that uh, all of the work that I'm going to present today uh, belongs to Vanderbilt. Uh, I've been uh, fortunate to be here 40 years now as uh, a learner, a physician in practice, a researcher, and now someone who is uh, very actively involved in pursuing quality and safety. I want you to use all the things that I'm suggesting today. Uh, I just learned five years ago that I found that someone was taking this stuff and reselling it. So use it, spread it, disseminate it, make it better. Uh, but Mother Vanderbilt says, uh, don't sell it. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, you know, we all talk about this issue of reliability. When I started training at Charity Hospital now over 40 years ago, we really were in a shame and blame environment. Jim Reasons came along and he talked to us about creating uh, intentionally designed systems, which we need to do. And all of us want to pursue this notion of failure-free operation. Uh, but to do that requires more than just saying that we're going to do this. It requires the organization to have a vision. It has to be translated into goals. They, there has to be defined core values. But there's also this notion of leadership. And I'm not talking about C-suite leadership. I'm talking about leadership of any member of the healthcare team who in a single moment is in an opportunity or position to lead. So that when we were doing our hand hygiene work at Vanderbilt and uh, perish the notion that we would have people that would not fully value that very important practice. Uh, it's not the C-suite that provides feedback at a bedside when I walk in to see a patient and I've forgotten to do something very important. So we want to emphasize again that we want to create a culture in which we respect individuals for their degrees and experience, but there are certain sort of things that we expect each other to do and we want to create a culture where people are willing to provide feedback. And that's what really a safety culture is. In my mind, a safety culture is a place where individuals feel free to speak up or report what we intentionally refer to as disturbances in the force. And we do that because we, again, want to avoid blaming. And many times when we make observations, they may not be right or exactly correct. But we want individuals to speak up, which means that they have to have psychological safety, and they must trust those of us in an administrative role that we both have their back, listen to their messages, and do something about the things that get reported regularly. Now, this is really what we try to live at Vanderbilt, and it is about this notion of pursuing the right balance. You know, Jim Reasons reminded us all about Swiss cheese and that we need intentionally designed systems because we put perfectly normal humans into situations where bad things happen. But what I want to talk about today is the other side of this balance beam, because we can continue to design systems correctly, but we also must expect humans to follow evidence-based practice to communicate clearly and effectively, to respect those things that we value as a medical group. And when we get off the pathway, and remember, I'm a pediatrician, so this is about early and often, we are willing to provide feedback to each other quickly so that we avoid pattern development. Because at the end of the day, medicine is inherently stressful for all of us. We know that occasionally we stub our toe. We know occasionally we will communicate in ways that may not be effective or rude or disrespectful. What we want to do, though, is when those circumstances occur, we want a culture where we hold each other accountable to pause and reflect. That's what the professional does. Let's talk about a specific case. 
because as we think about professional accountability, what does it really mean? So here's a case that occurred at an unnamed institution where I'm sitting and work and 46 year old with uh, a history of ulcerative colitis uh, goes to surgery for a transverse colon resection, uh, gets discharged, but unfortunately is readmitted six days after discharge with fever and abdominal pain. In this imaging, and I'm not a radiologist, but I trust my good colleagues, it reveals large fluid collections and abdominal abscesses, and we had to take the patient back to surgery. Now, I know nothing about GI surgery, but as the chief quality and safety officer of this institution, I know about numbers and I can count, and I routinely go back to my numbers to see how we're doing, and when we look at this particular case, human, adverse event, I go back and I look at my overall colon uh, standardized uh, infection ratios, and I don't like what I'm seeing. Uh, those of us listening today know that uh, we don't want to be average at one. We want to be below, and not only are we at this unnamed institution above one, we are going in the wrong direction. But I have friends who know what to do, so I ask all of my thoughtful uh, colorectal surgeons to come together. And I think it's really important. We get everybody in the room. And I presented the data and I said, look, I want you to look at these data. Tell me what, what's wrong with these data. But if you become uncomfortable with these data as I am, then I want you to let's get into the records. Let's look at our current performance. See if there are things that we are not doing consistently. See if there are things we're not doing at all. We want you to identify opportunities. And I want you to do two things. I want you to develop a plan to address standardized care, but I want every one of our distinguished surgeons to sign off publicly that I agree with every element. And if you guys can't agree, but with nine elements, we'll do nine elements. If you agree with seven, we'll do seven. But whatever we agree to, we are going to get out there and share and implement. So, the group took a while. They are slow but deliberate, and at the end of the day, they developed uh, nine elements of an evidence-based practice, and we communicated those through to everyone. We did this across service lines because everybody that's a stakeholder has got to understand. We started monitoring their performance and our outcomes so that in any single case, I know whether a particular surgeon has followed six of those elements, eight of those elements, or hopefully nine of those elements. Now, let me be very clear. Sometimes there are cases and circumstances that will direct that one of those elements can't be followed. That's fine, but the expectation is that my good distinguished surgical colleague is going to leave a note explaining why. So that's really easy. I mean, let's bring on the next problem. Let's solve several more. Well, the challenge is it's not exactly so easy because humans are humans and we can get these plans right, we can get these protocols right, we can create intentionally designed systems, but sometimes the human element creates some challenge. Now, at Vanderbilt, one of the things that we've done is promoted the ability of humans to speak up. Now, seven years ago, we got about 25 reports a year when one team member thought another team member was not behaving in a way that was fully professional. And since then, we have simply started delivering these data one at a time, and we now are getting about 1,200 of these stories a year, and they come in. I have two humans who review these, but here's a story that came in shortly after we put in our colorectal bundle. Uh, one of our distinguished nursing colleagues reported, Dr. Hickson, now that would be a serious problem, was performing a transverse colon resection. The nurse stated, Dr. Hickson, uh, you know, according to our new colorectal bundle, it's time to regown and reglove. Dr. Hickson looked up and replied, you know, well, I don't really agree with that particular element of the bundle. And, you know, I'm just not stopping now to change gloves and gowns. Now, Dr. Hickson in this case didn't spit, throw, cuss, just was as pleasant as they could be, but proceeded with surgical procedure. And you see, I put two questions on the bottom of this slide. The question is, do team members have a plan? Well, certainly in this circumstance, there is a situation in which 
the nursing professional knew to challenge, sometimes will challenge twice, but at some point, this has to be dealt with in a different way. Does the team have a plan? And then the other question is, what's our collective failure if we don't address these behaviors? And remember again, I'm a pediatrician, and this is about engaging early and often. Now, one of the other things that I want to make very clear, we don't solve these issues by dealing with personal courage alone. It takes personal courage. But the reality is that the medical leader, however constituted, has got to be supported by committed leadership, a project champion who is, in fact, dealing with the issue of professional accountability. And that human has got to have a sense of humor, got to have tenacity, because at the end of the day, this is tough work and not for the faint of heart. And they have to be supported by an implementation team that assists them with collecting and processing the data that will come in. The second issue is we've got to link all of this work to clear goals and values. Because at the end of the day, when I start having conversations with another human based upon what values. One of our uh, clear issues here is our credo. I make those I serve my highest, uh, my highest priority. I treat other humans with respect. This becomes then the basis of a conversation when someone may not appear to honor others. We have to have resources. This work is often under-resourced and requires clear time because you never know when you're going to have to go and have a conversation. And then you've got to have a standardized way to escalate the level of interventions. Because a fair principle is that if you're going to start collecting observations about my behavior and performance, I want to know how they're going to be shared, who gets to know, how they're going to be delivered to me, and what are the consequences if I don't appear to respond. Now, this is how we address variation in performance and promote safety. But there was a really interesting paper I read several years ago by Phelps. I don't like the title of this paper, and so I'm not going to read it. But the point was that he collected all of the literature in organizational behavior, and he looked at those factors that get in the way of people's ability to do their job. And one of the things that we know is that you can have one member of a medical team who behaves in ways that are not professional, and others tend to model that same behavior. But the thing that I was always interested in is this lesson trust issue. That if I am a nursing professional in an ICU or in, in an OR, and you have a reputation for being disrespectful, and you walk into the room, and I at the in the previous time have been doing a very complex task, Am I going to continue to maintain my focus on that task, or am I going to be distracted by your presence and track you around the room until you leave, and what happens to the quality of my performance? So we published this paper back about a month ago about rude surgeons and their association with avoidable surgical outcomes, and we're proud of this study. This is a study uh, that I thought about 10 years ago when a very thoughtful colleague of mine in North Carolina shared with me a story about a particular surgeon in that institution that was having trouble. So many of you will know that we have, over the years, listened to what patients and families say. Here are some examples of unsolicited patient complaints, and I want to emphasize the notion of unsolicited. These are complaints that are shared by families. We capture them. We put them into a database, but we process every one of them. And so here's some examples of complaints that have come in uh, at this institution where I'm sitting. While asking Dr. Hickson about my diagnosis, he responded that my questions were annoying. Wouldn't listen, kept speaking over me. The second one really bothers me. Ask uh, the patient to sign a consent form. It just turned out to be for another patient had the same last name, and for surgery on the opposite leg. Patients see things all the time, and thank goodness that we attempt to create a culture in which individuals will share so we can address issues, hopefully, in the moment. Now, from our JAMA paper back to, in 2002, we learned that those complaints are non-randomly distributed. 35 to 50 percent of physicians associated with any institution don't get any of those complaints in any 
four to six year period. On the other hand, 5% of team members account for better than 35% of these unsolicited complaints. We, in those earlier studies, link this to medical malpractice risk. The challenge was people always said, Hickson, your studies simply say that if you're nice to people, they won't sue you. But that always bothered me and was not very satisfying. So we recently put together a collaboration involving multiple institutions nationally with 800 surgeons and over 32,000 surgical procedures. And what we were interested in is whether or not surgeons who model rudeness and disrespect would be associated with more avoidable adverse outcomes. And so we created a study design in which we looked at the target surgery, but we only looked at complaints for the previous 24 months, because obviously if you have a bad outcome, you are more likely to complain. So we wanted to eliminate that effect. And then we looked at these surgeons and these 32,000 surgical procedures and what we found and what you see is for illustration purposes, we have lumped surgeons into four buckets. Those surgeons, who had almost no complaints at all in two years prior to the surgery, zero to four, versus at the opposite end on the right, those surgeons who got lots and lots of complaints. And what you see is if we look at the complication rates for those groups, you see that there's a difference. It's about a 14% difference from the lowest or the most respectful group to the least respectful group it only amounted to 426 additional complications. But if you and I were to take those numbers and we were to take the total volume of surgical cases in the U.S. each year, this is over 356,000 potentially avoidable surgical complications. And every measure in the NISQIP study, from medical complications to surgical complications, there was this same level of difference. And to illustrate that, this next slide simply shows just the infections. So if we look at urinary tract infections, we look at sepsis cases, we look at surgical site infections, it, there's a significant difference in comparing across all of these quartiles. There is an effect. Team members need to be able to come in and do their work and stay focused and not worry that they are being disrespected by the surgeon. There was also a really interesting paper in pediatrics just now, two years ago, in which they looked at the effect of rudeness on the willingness of other team members to seek help, the willingness of other team members to share information. And surprisingly, not so surprisingly, when I'm rude to you, as a nursing professional or an anesthesiologist or anyone else, you are less likely to seek help. You are less likely to share information with me. And what do you think happens to this whole notion of situational awareness? This is the challenge that some of our high risk surgeons who patients and families see as disrespectful. They carry those same characteristics into the OR. They behave in very predictable ways and unfortunately, they adversely affected the, the ability of the team to achieve intended outcomes. But patients aren't the only ones that see things, are they? So one of the other things that we've been working on recently is it in this work with the observations of coworkers. And Rick Boothman had a very kind comment about this particular paper, and it is exactly what we found, is that peer professionals will engage in sharing these observations, whether from patients or from staff, when supported by strong leadership commitment and an, an appropriate infrastructure. When you put those things together, professionals will stand up and do the right thing. Here are some examples of additional staff complaints from an unnamed institution where I work, but I want you to look at this last complaint. Dr. Hickson came into the nurse's station took my pack of crackers. The nurse spoke up and said, you know, those are my crackers. This particular physician just looked at me and then said, this is where I put my crackers and turned and walked off. You know, 
you look at this, and in our institution, we have now developed a com collective commitment. We deliver every one of these disturbances in the force. Because I want you to pause and think about how many times has someone eaten someone else's food before they will speak up in a formal way? How many times have individuals observed disrespectful, non-safe behaviors before they speak up? And in our view, when someone is courageous enough to share, we are going to share this report. We also share this report. These are some other data we've recently published, and now we have expanded this work. We have nearly 20,000 physicians now in our staff report database. And what we found is that somewhere between 88 and 90 percent of physicians and advanced practice nurses, we found the same phenomenon, get no staff reports in a three-year period. A small group get one, but 2.5 percent of physicians account for over 50 percent of these staff reports. So in our circumstance, that cracker complaint is far more important than sometimes we imagine. And so in our environment, we use our pyramid, which drives professional accountability. The vast majority of individuals are awesome. Leave them alone. But when a single disturbance comes in, like that cracker report or any of the other reports you've seen, we're going to screen it because there are certain things society says we never tolerate. We never lay hands on other humans. We do not come to work impaired with drug and alcohol. We do not discriminate when those assertions are made, those are mandated reviews. But the rest of the 99% of that 1,200, we simply deliver it with what we call a cup of coffee. And we go out and deliver that cup of coffee in a circumstance where someone has asserted, my crackers have been eaten. I don't know whether it's true or not. We do not investigate those reports. We found that that's destructive. Just get them shared. Because once you share them, one of two things happen. They happen again or they don't. If they happen again, we've established levels where we're going to bump this up to what we call an awareness intervention. We're still going to allow you to understand that we expect you to self-regulate. But if you can't, we may have to escalate to a guided intervention under authority. And our team members are oriented. This is how we work together. I want to share because we are pleased because many individuals often believe that you can't change Dr. Hicks's behavior ever. But in our work with patient complaints of the somewhere between four to 5% of physicians who get more than their fair share of patient complaints, 76% of them respond to that awareness intervention with a recidivism rate of 4%. And we've done nearly 2000 of those interventions now at multiple institutions nationally. 17% require plan B, which is that guided intervention, and almost all of those are required mental and physical health screening of owls. 7% unfortunately take the geographic solution. We don't have a lot of data yet with our coworker observations, but here we're finding 82% respond to the awareness intervention, 18% need plan B, and it's too early to see what happens to people and whether they stay or they go. We hope they stay and do well as good members of the team. Finally, I want to end, Kevin, by just simply saying that I think all of this is what it really means to be a professional, and we don't use that word enough. We too often call individuals providers. We are asking people to go above and beyond, but we are also asking them to go above and beyond this concept of just technical and cognitive competence. Because all we know now about modern safety science, it's all about effective communication, being available when we're supposed to be available, respecting other humans, patients, families, other members of the team, and pausing every once in a while to, to reflect on whether or not I am helping you get your work done. Kevin, I want to thank you for this opportunity to share about our new study. Uh, it's so satisfying to us because it isn't just about making patients happy. It's about being respectful, and when we are respectful, we gain the trust of patients and families. We elevate the performance of those individuals who work with us, and we maximize our ability to deliver the care we intend to deliver.